I guess it's nine o'clock over there or nine thirty mm -hmm. almost. Good morning. <laughs> Hi. Good morning. Um, how are you feeling? I mean, it must be a very exciting week for you. This Friday there will be a new album out, and I guess you will be playing a new or the first show for like 19 months, right? Yeah. It's um it's a lot to think about. <laughs> <laughs> um yeah, I'm like uh excited and anxious and nervous like this is going to be my first time traveling at all since stuff has been kind of locked down like i haven't oh. been on a plane at all we're flying out to riot fest on thursday to play our first show mm. um and then having the record come out the same day as our first show in 19 months it's just a lot to process i i don't think i'm ready to process it yet really a, a lot of i mean I don't know, like, it's hard for me to think about it right now. Like, it's hard to wrap my head around uh, the emotion involved. And um, I don't know. I mean, it seemed like for a while there that sh playing shows was not going to be an option for mm -hmm. who knows how long. So I'm, I'm just grateful to have a chance to do that. And um, I'm excited for people to hear the record. Um, And, you know, just like I have been for the last 19 months, you just kind of take it a day at a time and uh, go from there. Uh, do you feel like this is kind of a release show as it's the same day, like in the old days when, when people released records and made a special release show for that? Yeah, in a way. I mean, I feel like in the past we've done release shows and they've been uh, in front of a home crowd. And this is kind of going to be a festival crowd, which is exciting and unusual because um, there will be people watching us, I'm sure, that are not super familiar with what we do. Mm -hmm. um, it's also a little bit daunting to have your first show back after 19 months not playing shows uh, be in front of a giant festival crowd <laughs> I think so. probably, be, probably be a little easier to you know dip your toe in in that water if it were like 500 people in a club mm. um, but i'm just excited to do it and grateful that we can even do it at all so um we'll see how it goes i mean it's 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 got to start someday somewhere so right <laughs> Why not um, in Riot Fest? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, you didn't do any, any live streaming shows. Is that correct? That is correct. Um, we talked about it a little bit. Um, but as our timeline was kind of being shifted forward and backward with the record release um, and us thinking about when we would actually be able to go on tour again, it just didn't work out timeline wise um i think if there was a chance that this fall tour got canceled for whatever reason mm -hmm. we'd look at doing a live stream um but for right now like we were in a unique position where we finished the visu uh 15 year tour in like right at the beginning of march or end yeah. of february in 2020 And then, you know, a week or two later, everything shut down and that was the end. Um, so we kind of, we, we had planned to finish that tour and then finish up writing Horizons East and record it and then maybe have it out like fall 2020 okay. or, um, or even spring of 2021 and then tour around that. But, um, when it became clear that touring wasn't really going to be an option for the foreseeable future, we decided to give ourselves a little bit more time to, to work on stuff. So you've been working on the record before COVID, right? Or yeah, yeah. A majority of the ideas were written before COVID and then the final kind of finishing touches on the writing of everything came post COVID. Like or not post COVID, but during during COVID. Okay, um, this has got to be, be post COVID. Yeah, whatever <laughs> that is. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. 
Um, this will be like record number 11 if you yeah. count the alchemy index into two parts. We do so mm -hmm. or we don't? Um, I do. It's one project, but it's two. It's like a double album or double yeah. LP. Um, so we count it as, as two. Okay. Um, yeah, it, it will be out this Friday um, mm -hmm. digitally and physically, uh, I guess, the 8th on uh, October. Yeah, vinyl production is very slow. Yeah, a lot, of, a lot of bands had, had issues with that, I think. Yeah, it's really tough. It's really, really tough. And uh, you recorded it yourself again, mm -hmm. like um, Beggars and like the Alchemy Index. Yeah. Right? Um, mm -hmm. Was were there? I think in, in times like yeah, these times we have right now, um, it, it felt to me personally like um, you didn't actually know when things were going somewhere, and um, if and there were no real deadlines. Did you feel that yourself too? I mean, um, mm -hmm. when you go into the studio, you have these um, time slots. I mean, it, it costs a lot of money to record a, a yeah. record. <laughs> And mm -hmm. um, if you do it yourself, then this time pressure is not there, I think. Right. So um, was that any influential on, on the writing process or, or recording process? Um, we had made the decision to do the record ourselves more or less like right after we finished recording Palms. Um, we ended up finding a space that we could build a studio at. And that's been kind of the the longer framed goal for the last couple of years, I guess. Um, so that was the plan, but yeah, like having this space that I'm in right now and being able to have our schedule be a little more flexible than normal. Um, if writing went a little bit too long or like something came up like on a personal side, um, that needed to delay something. It wasn't like the end of the world where we're like, Oh man, okay. We lost that you know, studio we were going to track drums at because so-and-so got sick and now they can't get us in until April or something. Mm. Um, and then just the comfort of being in here and knowing that, you know, every hour that passes isn't costing you hundreds and hundreds of dollars. Um, the freedom to experiment a little bit more because you do have more time and you are spending less. Um, Just experimenting with different microphones and setups and um, you know how stuff is recorded. Um, it was really, really helpful. And it was something that we missed because we did do beggars and, and the alchemy index on our own. Um, it was nice doing records in a studio again with major minor and to be everywhere and palms, but there is that added pressure and then when you're working with a producer you have in some positive ways and some negative ways you have another opinion that you have to deal mm. with so it was nice to just kind of trust what the four of us do and realize that we understand what makes us sound the way we want to sound so we just focused on capturing that and that is horizons east it's not um thrice filtered through what like a producer thinks thrice should sound like right now mm -hmm. it's thrice coming directly from us unfiltered and we're all really happy with how it came out yeah i mean it sounds great i had the chance to to listen to it and you again did a really good job and uh, I, thank you i say it objectively not only as a fan myself but it's really really strong record yeah. and thank um you. Yeah, as I was listening to it, I was wondering, there are songs like Northern Lights, for example, um, which sound a bit different pro, um, productively. Mm -hmm. um, is it so? It felt like uh, it has these heavy Alchemy Index vibes, which had this natural organic sound. And uh, as it starts with, I think, you, like, uh, you know, clicking yeah 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 whatever whatever you call it um and i i got these heavy alchemy index vibes and is it is it so is it uh, um uh, recorded differently in in this way 
yeah, I feel like kind of going back to the recording ourselves thing, when we record ourselves, we have the freedom to do stuff that maybe a producer would be like, ah, I don't think that's a great idea. Mm -hmm. And part of that is like, and we did this a lot with the Alchemy Index, is trying to make the listener almost feel like they're in the room with us, yeah. um, watching a studio session. So that's why there are like noises like the stick click intro or, you know, the sound of somebody sitting down on a piano bench or mm. uh, somebody plugging their guitar in or something. It's just a way to further draw the listener into what's happening and what they're listening to. Um, a lot of music now is so perfect and uh you know, it's all chopped up and even the pauses like are gridded out so that it's robotically perfect. And it just removes the human aspect from the music mm. to me um, and makes it really sterile feeling. And as a result, makes a lot of stuff sound very similar to other stuff. Yeah. So we wanted it to feel like somebody came in off the street had a seat on the floor of the studio and watch this track, the song. Yeah, I mean, with uh, streaming being one of the main channels people uh, listen to music mm -hmm. in, in these times, um, songs seem to seem to be cut down to the very most important things, like almost no intro and then go straight into the song and don't make it lot, uh, longer than about three minutes to yeah. have as many as many streams as as possible um but i i really like that that you do it differently on this one um thank you we're <laughs> uh, we're big on that like we had to do a, a radio edit of scavengers for radio obviously um and that song i think on its own i ha actually have a note of it right here <laughs> the song by itself is like four minutes and 45 seconds, roughly. Mm. And uh, the general consensus with radio people is like, it has to be under four minutes or, yeah. or close to like three minutes and 30 seconds. So we, we had to ag agonize over like, okay, what do we take out of this? Like, oh, I do like the way the re-intro is, uh, you know, two more bars on the regular version or, um, the bridge is doubled uh, and we wrote it that way for a purpose. But then when it gets into like a mass consumption radio or streaming format, mm. you almost have to edit it down to like the bare bones. Um, and I, I understand like the purpose of that and, and that it has some function, but I think if that's the way that the song was supposed to be, we would have, written it that way probably but yeah uh best, best best example might be um i guess it's boulevard of broken dreams by green day which uh, mm -hmm. is played in in germany in radio sometimes and there's this heavy part at the end and uh i don't know how long it is but in in this radio version it's like do, 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 do. And then it's it's just out uh, yeah you always <laughs> feel like yeah that's like one of the best parts of this song and then it just yeah, rush it's right. rush it's it's, out. <laughs> yeah, it's there for four seconds. And you're like, ah. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, we can't um talk about this record without leaving out uh the rumors going on about a mm. second album uh being related to Horizon East. Um what can you say about it if you wanted to tell us something about it? Um I can say that um East would imply a West. Uh, some people have guessed that it also implies a North and a South, but I can assure you that we don't have that many songs <laughs> <laughs> ready to go. Um, so we wrote like, I want to say close to, we had about 20 ideas for songs. Mm -hmm. And then we kind of distilled that down to about 15 And then there are 10 on East. And the five that didn't make the cut are being edited. And they're not 
they didn't make the cut. Uh, the reason that they didn't make the cut was not because they were not good enough. It was because they did not fit into the vision we had. Um, cause the, the vision from the get go was always to do two records. Mm. Um, and I think that's all I can say right now is that we <laughs> have, fine. we have some stuff written, we have more writing to do. Um, but I think at the end of the day, it will all come together like one large piece of music, or at least that's the intention. It's mm. just up to us to, to make that happen. And I think we, that might be, there might be a chance it will come out like next year or something. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Barring any unforeseen circumstances. Yeah. Mm. Okay. Yeah. As I said, you will be touring again uh, after Riot Fest. There will be like, I guess, 28 dates through the mm -hmm. States, um, starting off with Houston, Texas on the 24th. Yes. Um, What do you think about what might have changed for you as as a musician uh, during these times? I mean, you got a lot of backlash for uh, releasing a statement how to how people could go to the to the yeah. Uh, shows. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, do you feel like you will act differently? I mean, at normal normal shows, mm -hmm. you would have interviews in person you might sign merch at the merch table and so on mm -hmm. and so on do you think that would change for this tour yes very much so and uh it's not by choice it's just a matter of us doing everything we can to keep us safe um if we limit the amount of exposure that we have to other people we limit the amount of exposure potentially to the virus mm. um if anybody gets sick we have to cancel shows and nobody wants that um we don't want to have to cancel a tour we don't want to have to cancel any shows so we're going to be as safe as possible um across the board And yes, that does mean like no in-person interviews and no backstage guests and no hanging out and taking photos and shaking hands and signing stuff. And it sucks. And we hope that it's not going to be like this for mm. much longer than a tour or maybe two tours, but it's what we need to do right now. And we're all in this together and um, we need to act like it. I mean, we could just say, pardon my language, but fuck it. We're just going to do whatever. And then, you know, somebody gets sick, you cancel a show. Somebody else gets sick. You got to cancel more shows. Then your tour is canceled. And then it's like, what's, you know, what's the point of doing this? So, yeah. and as far as the, the negative backlash was concerned, we knew that was going to happen because oh, sure. people are so polarized over public safety now, apparently. Um, But we want to we want to do everything we can in our power to make shows as safe as possible for the people who choose to attend them. Mm -hmm. And the same way you make a personal choice that you maybe don't want to get vaccinated or maybe don't want to wear a mask, we can also make a personal choice that says if you don't want to do those things, you can skip this show. Yeah, like you don't have to be there. So. Um, personal choices have public consequences because we're a, a society. So, um, some of the rules that we mentioned are, uh, live nation rules and AEG rules. Mm. Um, we are not making those rules, but we support them. And we're saying that these are the rules. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> And then the mask thing that we did was just like, we would encourage you to wear a mask so we can limit the transmission of this if possible. Um, and we hope most people will, will heed that. And that's about all we can do. I mean, <laughs> yeah. other than stay, stay home, which I don't think anybody really wants in this situation. Mm. So, I guess uh, you and also Dustin are very vocal about the, this topic, uh, getting mm -hmm. the vaccine. 
Um, I don't know if you heard of it, but uh, like Armand of uh, Sick of It All just mm -hmm. posted some strange things against getting vaccinated. Um, and I can imagine being a musician and also like Madball and all these crazy New York hardcore shows that took place uh, months ago. Um, mm -hmm. Is it somehow frustrating for you seeing those bands who might be influential for you, for you or yourself um, having a different opinion on this topic? Um, I don't... I'd say it's disappointing not because of the band association. I just think as people, like you can make an educated decision or you can um, choose to make a decision based on the other information, mm. the veracity of which is, I, I, I don't know. <laughs> um, but like I said earlier, like personal choices have public consequences. Like if I decide, if I make a deeply personal decision to get wasted and drive 120 miles an hour on a residential street, that's not fucking safe and it's not smart. And, yeah. Uh, I don't know. I mean, it's such a, it's such a complex discussion. It's hard to like hash it out now uh, <laughs> without understanding like why these people are making the choices that they make. Mm. But um, I don't know. There's, there's data that you can look at. And yeah. It's not a, some. I mean, I mean. Guru, guru on Instagram telling you that like, all you have to do is take a lot of vitamin D or something it's yeah. people who have been studying viruses and uh, vaccines for decades. Mm. So I don't know. <laughs> yeah. Stop there. Well, some, I, I don't know if, if I speak for you, but social media seems to be very toxic um, in, in mm -hmm. these terms. And um, I sometimes wish we, we wouldn't have this, like strong networking thing going on as I can really know so much more about people than I actually want to know, like political right. views or things. But I mean, there are so many bands and, and musicians coming out being like racist and doing strange things, mm -hmm. um, which is a shame as you really like the music and it can be very frustrating to like, delete all, all, all the music from your mobile phone as you can't right. listen to that. Um, yeah, but let, let's go back to, to some music. I mean, you've been, <laughs> <laughs> you haven't been on stage for 19 months. Uh, how do you prepare for, uh, or how did you prepare for this tour? Practice a lot. Um, <laughs> yeah, I mean, we've been so focused on this new record and um, figuring out how we're going to play these songs live. <clears throat> so even when I was doing kind of my, my own practice along with, you know, my phone, <clears throat> I was really focusing on the new stuff. Mm. And then we put a set list together for tour and I was like, Oh dang, like, I don't remember how that song goes. <laughs> or like, so then I had to go back and learn the old stuff. Um, but we've been running the set like almost every weekday. Um, for like a month now and stuff's stuff's feeling normal. Like we wanted to make it feel like we've already been on tour for a month, almost once the tour starts mm. um, instead of like practicing really sporadically and then taking a little time off before the tour starts. And then like all of a sudden you have your first show. And, um, but I think stuff is feeling good. Like the new stuff is really, really fun to play live. Mm. Um, I can't wait to see how it goes over live. Mm. Um, um, and I'm just excited. I hope I'm like in physical shape to, to do this anymore. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I guess you've asked the fans for their dream set list. Uh, mm -hmm. Does it 
influence the next tour or what yeah what did you do um, this one it, it will inform our set list for this tour a little bit and it helps us going forward too um when you have 11 records i mean we <laughs> only played songs from like nine of them but um and you play a 20 song set it's hard to keep everybody happy because mm -hmm. you have you have a section of the, of our fans that are like I wish they would just play stuff from Illusion of Safety and Artist in the Ambulance and then like maybe a song from Visu. Yeah. And then you have uh another group that really likes the like mid era thrice, like the Beggars, uh Alchemy Index stuff, Major Minor. And then you have people who have uh become fans of the band because of like Black Honey and the To Be Everywhere record. Mm. And trying to keep everybody happy is so, <laughs> so difficult. Um, and in the interest of not driving us ourselves insane by learning like 50 songs for a tour. Um, and because we have so many different guitar tunings that, you know, throughout records that if we were to really make it uh, an accurate representation of all of the records, the guys would be changing guitars between every song and then that's a dead spot in the set. And then mm -hmm. that makes your set kind of suck. <laughs> I mean, like, <laughs> nobody goes to a show to watch a guy tune his guitar. Right. So, yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah. They're like, Oh man, not this we went again. To the radio. We went to the radio head <laughs> show and Johnny Greenwood was tuning his guitar and it was so sick. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. But, um, It's it's a challenge, but if we can get feedback from uh, fans that care enough to fill out one of those dream set lists, mm. it's a pretty good picture of like what we should play on a tour. So um, more information is always good. Um, I watched an interview of Dustin and Tepe, which came out like three years ago, I think, and there they said or, or they talked about the heavier fry stuff the older music and mm -hmm. um i guess tepe said he couldn't like uh, play these songs anymore or couldn't write songs like this anymore dustin uh, agreed on this but are there mm -hmm. any songs you would love to play the guys don't want to <laughs> oh um i think mm. Not really. I do really like the messenger from Alchemy Index. Mm -hmm. uh, that's a really fun one to play live that we haven't played live in a long time. Um, I like the Arsonist from the Fire EP, if we're talking about heavy stuff. Mm -hmm. um, but we've played that a decent amount. Uh, Illusion of Safety, I feel like... Um, Where Idols Once Stood would be pretty fun. And artists like Abolition of Man would be fun. Oh, yeah. Nice. Yeah. Um, and I think, I mean, I know those guys don't listen to as much heavy music as they used to. I know Tepe can play that stuff if he <laughs> wants to, because it will so be too. a practice or sound check and he'll rip out some like awesome Converge riff or mm. Metallica riff, like old Metallica. Um, so I think they're capable of it. It's just not what's moving them right now, like, and inspiring them. Um, and we have talked at times about like, what if we did an EP where everything was like super heavy and crazy, mm -hmm. but then at the same time, it's also, what if we did an EP where it was like more acoustic or folky or jazzy or something just like yeah. to scratch those itches a little bit um but yeah as you, as you said um it, it's kind of hard to to get into these older songs um i don't know if you are into oasis a bit um i'm not like a super fan but i am familiar enough that i might know some stuff yeah um i watched I guess it was from Reading Festival this year, mm -hmm. like 
three or four weeks ago and Liam Gallagher was uh, solo there and um, mm. the camera angle was a bit mm, bad for him as there was this mm -hmm. big teleprompter standing in front of him oh, no. <laughs> with the lyrics of Stand By Me, not Ben E. King's one, but the Oasis song. And I was like, oh man, is it so hard to remember the lyrics? Is it so hard? I mean, I haven't released like 11 records or more like you or him, but is it that hard? <laughs> uh, it shouldn't be. <laughs> um, yeah, I don't know. I know that the uh, teleprompter or the iPad thing is not uh, that unusual. Okay. Um, or uh, you, if you wanted to go analog, like I, I drum teched for Weezer for a while and Rivers would have uh, lyric sheets taped to his monitor. Okay. So instead of an iPad or teleprompter, he's just got pages and pages of lyrics but i think it's not so much like you or i if we completely forgot the lyrics to a song we might print out the whole song and then like read along it's more just using it for cues and i think it's pretty easy to maybe interchange verses accidentally Like you start playing the song and the first verse comes in and, oh shit, I'm singing the second verse. And then the second verse comes <laughs> along and you're like, okay, I already sang the second verse. Should I sing the second verse again or should I freestyle and do the first verse? Or Maybe um, they don't notice. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, so I don't know. Like uh, even even if you practice and practice and practice and practice, like I could imagine there were like a hundred thousand people at that Reading show. Yeah, of course. That's enough to make even the hugest musician kind of tune out for a second and be like, Whoa, Holy crap. What am I doing here? And then you lose your place and forget lyrics. So even, even one of the Gallagher brothers. <laughs> yes. Yes. <laughs> The flawless Gallagher's. Yeah. Um, you've launched the Fries Alliance and uh, mm -hmm. Dustin also has his Patreon going on and his podcast and stuff. And I've noticed that a lot of bands are doing these, uh, how can we call it, side, side hustles, like fan base supporting things. Yeah. Uh, do you think like that... Club. Yeah. Is, do you think this is like a future model for bands? I mean, in times like these, it's kind of helpful to not have to go on tour, but to still get some, some cash. Yeah. Uh, I think it's essential now. Um, because we were without shows for 18, 19 months. Um, and as a result of shows being gone, um, uh, And some people still not being comfortable coming to shows yet. Um, you know, your guarantees are down, your attendance will be down, your merch numbers will be down. Um, I have a number of friends that are on the road right now and they're like, yeah, it's, it's awesome to be out, but it's really hard out here. Like mm. it's, it's very different. It's not anything near, you know, what it was like. Mm. And taking that into account, like you have to find other ways to keep the business side of being in a band sustainable and Patreon or the Alliance um, kind of gives you an opportunity to maybe make up some of that lost sustainability. Um, and then just with like with streaming royalties, Like so many people stream music now instead of actually buying vinyl or if anybody buys CDs anymore or cassettes. Mm. And the the payout per stream is just ridiculous. Yeah. Um, and then the response to that is, oh, we'll just put out more music. But then you dilute the the music that you're putting out. Like, do you want 200 ideas or do you want the 15 best ideas mm. um 
And until something changes, I think that uh, stuff like Patreon or our Alliance thing, that's kind of the way forward now, um, or at least a, a big part of it. Mm. Just because every, everything is different now. Nobody knew what it was going to, gonna be like and i don't think we still have a very clear picture of what it's going to be like because it's Mm. ever changing but it's it's something that can help out yeah i mean one of the best things if if there's any of the pandemic is that uh, musicians had the time to really focus on the music and, and bring out some some great records i think of mm. afi citizen glittera which is ned rosin from title fight if you yeah yeah know this project um a quicksand for example uh kings of leon i think there's a lot of mm. good music um that has come out during the pandemic um you are very vocal on your instagram about what mm. you're listening to do you have like yeah. two or three good um tips for us what we should listen to um let's see uh the new i've kind of been going crazy on social media about this lately but the new low record is insane to me um it's beautiful and the production is so enthralling like it's not a record that you just drop in and listen to a song it's the kind of thing that you set aside like 45 minutes and you find some good headphones and you put it on and you close your eyes and you let it just do its thing to you. Mm. Um, but it's the way it's mixed and the tones, it's all so like, it feels like it's needing your brain. Like <laughs> it's, re- it's really awesome. Um, trying to think of what else I really like from this year. I've been on a big new kick. They don't have anything new, but mm-hmm. um, I listened to Mew a little bit back in uh, like the mid 2000s. And then for whatever reason, went somewhere else for a bit. And then I'm just going back and revisiting all their records. And it's just crazy. It's like pop rock, but made by people from a different planet or something it's just <laughs> other otherworldly um what else do i really like from this year mm. there's a band from utah called black shape okay and they do kind of it's kind of like a progressive um it's not really metal it's heavy It's kind of leaning in that like post rock, post metal zone, and it's instrumental and um, kind of really cathartic and like uplifting. And I think they're like just getting started. I, I think it might be their first first LP, and they haven't really done much touring, if any, because of the way that things are. But um, I'm excited to see what happens with them. Okay, so it's a local band. Um, kind of. from Utah from Utah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Um and then there's a Kowloon Walled City record coming out in October that um I may or may not have heard and it's really really good. <laughs> and I'm excited about that. Awesome. Got to check them out. Thank you very much, Riley, for yeah. your time. Um, Thank you. I hope you stay healthy. I wish you all the best for uh, the release of the record for the tour. Um, you will be at Vainstream Festival. It was announced today in, in Germany next year, which is super cool. <laughs> yeah. Fingers <laughs> crossed. <laughs> yeah. Anytime we announce anything now, I'm like, ah, cool. Well, maybe. <laughs> I hope. Yeah, so let's 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 do this. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Uh, best wishes to the other guys and yeah, stay healthy. Thanks, man. That was really fun. I appreciate Thanks, it. Thanks, man. See ya. Bye bye. Yeah, bye.